we have discussed thus far the <coughs> various post translation modifications that takes place for uh, histones and how all these post translation modifications affect chromatin structure and also the gene expression. We have studied how histones are acetylated, how they are then deacetylated, then histone acetylation, histone methylation, histone phosphorylation, histone demethylation and so forth and so forth. What we will discuss today is also see in addition to the post translation modifications of histones, the DNA itself is also subjected to certain modification and the one particular modification we are going to discuss today is about methylation of DNA. So, today's topic we are going to discuss about how methylation of cytosine residues in DNA is going to affect gene expression in eukaryotes. <coughs> so, before we begin I will just want to just briefly summarize what we have learned so far as, uh, as I have discussed in the previous classes. We began with eukaryotic RNA polymerases, then we discussed about the various code promoter elements and how their variations can influence gene regulation. Then we discussed about various general transcription factors starting from TF2 A, B, D, E, F and so on and so forth, how they affect gene regulation and how variations within the general transcription factors itself can bring about differences in the uh, levels of gene expression. Then we moved further up in the promoter, discussed about upstream activation sequences, distal promoter sequences, proximal promoter sequences and how various transcription factors through their DNA binding domain bind to the upstream activation sequences and to their transactivation domains can interact with general transcription machinery and bring about transcription activation. Then we discussed a very important aspect of gene regulation wherein we said DNA is not present as naked DNA in the inside the cells, DNA is actually present as chromatin and therefore we discussed how chromatin templates are transcribed in vivo as well as in vitro and then we brought in the role of histones and we discussed about how histones act as negative regulators of gene expression and unless you modify the histones either add an acetyl group or remove the acetyl group or methylate or phosphorylate, histones cannot be moved around and depending upon whether histones bind DNA tightly or bind DNA loosely, activation or repression of transcription can take place and there is a whole bunch of regulators which do these modifications of histones. And then we brought about a very important concept called histone code in addition to the genetic code and uh, today we will discuss about a very new concept in regulation of gene, uh, gene expression in eukaryotes namely how methylation of DNA influences gene regulation. We all know the DNA consists of four different bases like adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine. Now, among, among these four bases it turns out the cytosine actually can undergo methylation <coughs> in DNA of eukaryotes in especially higher eukaryotes. So, you can see this is the usual GC base pair that is exists in double standard DNA, the guanine base pairs with cytosine and there are three hydrogen bonds between the guanine and cytosine in eukaryotic DNA. And what we are going to discuss is that there are a bunch of enzymes in eukaryotic cells and these are known as DNA methyl transferases or DNMTs. And it turns out this DN, the, this DNA methyl transferases can actually add a methyl group at the phi position of the cytosine residue and therefore, you can convert cytosine into a phi methyl cytosine. So, this is a very important modification which has a very profound role in regulation of gene expression and this is what we are going to discuss in this class today. It turns out these enzymes which are called as the DNA methyl transferases, they contain what is called as a methyl CPG binding domains there has to be a H here, I apologize for the mistakes, METHIL. So, it is methyl CPG binding domains or MBDs and it is through these methyl binding domains that these uh, uh, DNA methyl transferases add a methyl group to the, uh, DNA, to the cytosine residues of DNA. <coughs> and in fact, it turns out in case of humans, if you take the genomic DNA in humans, almost 1 percent of the total DNA in humans undergo uh, accounts for methyl cytosine. Okay? Whereas, very interestingly in other eukaryotes, especially lower eukaryotes like Drosophila and Cynorhabditis elegans which is a nematode, you do not see DNA methylation. So, this is a very important difference unlike the histone modifications which occur in almost all the eukaryotes starting from uh, fly to uh, or yeast to man, the DNA methylation has not been reported to take place in many of the lower eukaryotes like Drosophila and C. elegans, but it is very, very well reported in mammals especially mouse and humans and is also well studied. Mm. So, when, when you come to regulation of gene expression which is what is the focus of uh, our lecture series, it turns out methylation of a set of sequences known as CPG islands plays a very, very important role in the regulation of gene expression. <coughs> 
So, this dinucleotide CGCG okay, is what is the target for this DNA methylate transferases and this dinucleotide repeats the cytosine gets methylated in select regions. The CPG sequences can often often be present up to 1 to 2 kilo base stretches. Huge stretches of this dinucleotide CG repeats may be present in certain regions of the promoters and stress, such stretches are actually called as CPG islands. For example, if you look at the mouse genome, there are about 15,000 such CPG islands have been estimated to be present, whereas in the human genome, the number may be as high as 40,000 such CPG islands may be present. Okay? So, many of the genes which are constitutively expressed, which are actually called as housekeeping genes, these housekeeping genes as well as those genes which are expressed in a tissue specific manner, they contain the CPG islands in their promoter regions. <coughs> For example, if you take the gamma globin gene, the promoter region in and around the transcription start site, that is 200 base pairs upstream and 100 base pairs downstream of the transcription start site, when methylated leads to transcription depression. So, in general, the, the basic rule before we go into the details of this uh, talk, remember methylation of the CPG, the cytosine in the CPG results in depression of transcription, whereas demethylation results in activation of transcription. Okay. This is what has been shown. <coughs> so, a number of promoters in eukaryotic genes contain what are called as CPG islands and when these CPG islands are present in unmethylated states, you get transcription activation. Whereas, in the same CPG islands, when they are present in a methylated form, it results in transcription depression. So, these enzymes which add a methyl group to the cytosine residue in CPG islands act as a negative regulators of gene expression in the case of eukaryotes. Remember this point. So, in the, the uh, important principle that we are going to discuss is that DNA methylation actually represses transcription in eukaryotes. How does DNA methylation repress transcription? <coughs> As I told you, these MBD proteins which contain this methyl CPG binding domain, they recognize what are called as, the, they recognize methylated cytosines and bind to them. Sorry, I made a mistake in the uh, previous slide. The MBD uh, proteins which recognize this methylated cytosines contain the MBD domain. DNA methyl transferases do not contain MBD domains. DNA methyl transferases add a methyl group to the cytosine and then once the cytosine is methylated, these methyl cytosine is actually recognized by proteins called uh, MBD proteins which actually contain methyl CPG binding domain. That is why they are called MBD proteins. Okay? So, these MBD proteins contain a methyl CPG binding domain and through, through these domains, they actually recognize the specific methyl group of cytosine residues in the DNA. And there are a number of such methyl um, uh, CPG binding domain containing proteins have been identified so far in uh, different eukaryotes like they are called as for example, MECP1, MECP2, MBD1, 2, 3, 4 and so on and so forth. And the, these, uh, these enzymes or these proteins vary in a number of different properties as well as in the structure. And for example, the MECP1 actually may, uh, mainly methylates many methylated CPGs. Whereas, the MECP2 actually methylates only a single CPG base pairs. <coughs> okay? So, that there are many uh, minor differences between these enzymes and also on their ability to methylate various CPG islands. <coughs> so, these MBD proteins, when they recognize the cytosine residues in the DNA and when they bind, they then go and recruit repressors or co-repressors and these co-repressors repressor complex usually contain either histone deacetylases or histone methyl transferases and when these are recruited to the promoters that leads to transcription repression. So, the message I want to convey you is that DNA methylation acts in conjunction with histone modifications to bring about transcription repression. So, once DNA is cytosine in the DNA is methylated, these methyl cytosines are recognized by specific enzymes which contain these MBD domains and once they recognize these methyl CPG islands, uh, cytosine residues and bind the DNA, then they recruit uh, enzymes uh, which negatively modulate uh, gene expression such as the histone deacetylases or histone methyl transferases. They then modify the histones in the vicinity of the promoter leading to tightening of histones and resulting repression of transcription. For example, an MBD protein such as MECP2 is actually one of the components of a big repressor called syn3 repressor, which is a multi-protein complex and one of the components of this repressor is a MBD containing protein, the, namely the MECP2 and this repressor complex also contains a histone deacetylase. So, you can see the methyl binding proteins or the methyl cytosine binding proteins actually attract the histone modifying enzymes such as histone deacetylases and histone methyl transferases and that is how they repress gene expression. 
So, the major mechanism by which DNA methylation repress transcription is by actually recruiting histone deacetylases or histone methyl transferases to the vicinity of the promoter through the interaction of the MBD proteins with these uh, histone modifiers. <coughs> So, this is the general mechanism of transcription repression by DNA methylation I have depicted in the form of a cartoon. Let us say for example, there is a transcription active chromatin where specific residues in the H3 or H4 and histones are actually acetylated that is what I have shown here. And once the DNA in this nucleosome is methylated, this methylated cytosine is now recognized by the uh, methyl binding protein or the MBD containing protein in this case for example, the, the MECP2 and once this MECP2 binds to this methyl cytosine residue of the DNA, this now attracts a co-repressor complex and this co-repressor complexes usually contain negative regulators of gene expression such as histone deacetylases or histone methyl transferases and in this case for example, if this contains histone deacetylase then this removes acetyl groups of the histones and therefore, the histones now bind the DNA very tightly thereby preventing the assembly of pre-initiation complex resulting in the repression of gene, re gene expression. So, this is a very general mechanism by which DNA methylation brings about repression of transcription in eukaryotes. Now, very interestingly, there is a compound, this is the normal structure of cytosine where I have shown and this is the 5, uh, 5 carbon of the cytosine and if you now replace this 5 carbon of cytosine with a nitrogen, then this becomes 5 aza cytosine and it turns out this 5 aza cytosine cannot be methylated because there is no carbon there. And when this 5, 5 aza cytosine is incorporated to the DNA, it cannot be methylated and therefore, <coughs> uh, this can actually inhibit DNA methylation. So, 5 as a cytidine is a very important uh, repressor of DNA methylation. So, when you treat cells with 5 as a cytosine, DNA methylation is, is inhibited and we will now go ahead and then see how inhibitors of DNA methylation can be used not only understand the importance of DNA methylation inside the cells, but they also have very important applications in treatment of cancer and many other diseases and so on and so forth. So, just remember there is an important carpole called 5 as a cytosine which contains nitrogen in the place of carbon in the 5 position and therefore, this 5 as a cytosine cannot be methylated and when you incorporate, when 5 as a cytidine gets incorporated into uh, DNA, it cannot be methylated and therefore, it, uh, 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 it serves as an inhibitor of DNA methylation. And 5 as a cytidine is often is often abbreviated as AZT and it is often used to demonstrate or study the effect of DNA methylation on gene expression. So, you take cells which are not treated with azacytidine, you take cells which are treated with azacytidine. Now, what happens? This azacytidine now get uh, ACT now gets incorporated in the DNA and therefore, this DNA cannot be methylated and therefore, if you now take look at the gene expression status of this DNA which is not treated with azacytidine and cells which are treated with azacytidine and compare the gene expression pattern, you can clearly say whether DNA methylation had a role, has a role in gene expression or not. So, when incorporated to the DNA in the place of cytosine, demethylated sites are created because this azacytin cannot be methylated by DNA methyl transferases. And it turns out when cells are treated with azacytidine, it results in profound, say, profound changes in gene expression patterns. And this was demonstrated way back in 1980s and 90s, in fact, even earlier. And in fact, this clearly told that somehow DNA methylation seems to be playing a very important role in regulation of gene expression. And what happens when you treat these cells with this kind of a DNA methylation inhibitors, certain genes which are not normally expressed. Remember DNA methylation is a negative regulator of transcription. So, what happens when you incorporate azacytidine as an inhibitor of DNA methylation? The DNA methylation is prevented and therefore, many genes which are normally prom uh, whose promoters are normally methylated are not expressed. When you treat cells with these compounds, these genes are now beginning to get expressed because methylation or negative regulation is lost. Now, how do you identify? that a specific CPG sequences in a specific DNA fragment is getting methylated or not. There is a very, very simple methodology that is actually used and it is a very well known methodology. This is actually by using a set of restriction enzymes called MSP1 and HEPA2. These are called isoschizomers. That is MSP1 and HEPA2, they recognize the same sequence. Both of them recognize CCGG, but there is a small difference in their activity. Let us see what have, how exactly they do it. Let us say we have a DNA fragment here which contains 3 CCGG uh, motifs. So, there are 3 sites for uh, 3 restrictions for the recognition of MSP1 or HEPA2. And let us assume that one of the cytosine is actually methylated among the 3. When you now take this DNA and when you cut it with HEPA2, 
when you digest with HEPA2, now HEPA2 does not distinguish whether the cytosine is sorry, HEPA2 does not cleave if the cytosine is methylated within the CCGG. Therefore, although the recognition sequence for MSP and HEPA2 are the same, HEPA2 will not cleave if the cytosine here is methylated within CCGG, whereas MSP1 does not care whether cytosine is methylated or not. So, when you take a DNA in which one among the three CCG modules is methylated and cut them with HEPA2, HEPA2 will cleave only here and here, but not here. So, you will this site does not get cleaved. So, HEPA2 action is blocked by methylation of an internal C in the CCGG cutting sequence. Now, let us see what happens when you do the same digestion with instead of HEPA2, if you treat the same DNA with MSP1, what happens? Now, MSP1, if you cut the same DNA with MSP1, MSP1 does not care whether the C is methylated or non methylated as long as the recognition sequence CCGG and therefore, it cuts with equal efficiency and therefore, all the three sides will get cleaved by MSP1. Mm. So, MSP1 action is unaffected by methylation of the internal C residues in the CCG cutting sequence. So, what is the net outcome of all these things? So, when you take a specific DNA in which certain C's are methylated within the CCG sequence and do a duplicate digestion, one with MSP1 and another with HEPA2 and then compare the restriction digestion pattern by doing a southern blot or something. For example, in the genome we want to say a specific region, a specific promoter region is getting methylated or not. So, what you do? You take the genomic DNA, cut them with MSP1 or HEPA2 and then run it on agrogel and transfer to nitrocellulose and do a southern blot with a promoter specific probe. So, what happens? If there is a difference, if there is no methylation in this promoter, you will get an identical restriction pattern for MSP1 and HEPA2. But if there is a difference in the restriction pattern between MSP1 and HEPA2, that means there is some methylation and that is why these two enzymes are behaving differently. So, HEPA2 can actually be used to determine how many CCG sequence in a promoter region are actually methylated and when the DNA is non-methylated, both MSP1 and HEPA2 will generate identical restriction digestion patterns, whereas if the DNA is methylated, HEPA2 will generate fewer fragments than MSP1. So, by using this very simple restriction digestion using isoschizomers MSP1 and HEPA2, you can actually find out whether a specific promoter region has been methylated or not in vivo. It is a very, very simple, but very efficient and very widely used technique for demonstrating methylation of CPG sequences in a promoter region. There is also a much more recent technique which is actually used to determine from, uh, methylation of DNA that is actually called as bisulfide sequencing and this is also used to identify methylation patterns of DNA. Now, treatment of DNA with bisulfide converts cytosine residues to uracil, but it does not affect, does not do anything for the 5-methyl cytosine. So, only cytosine is converted into uracil when you treat DNA with bisulfide, whereas methyl cytosine is not affected. Therefore, bisulfide treatment introduces specific changes in the DNA sequence that depends on the methylation status of individual cytosine residues. Now, the bisulfide sequencing is a little bit elaborate procedure. I am not going to go and discuss in detail how exactly the bisulfide sequencing is actually carried out to identify whether DNA is methylated or not. This bisulfide sequencing has become a very, very important tool. Uh, in fact, we are going to discuss this in detail in the later classes when we are going to talk about gene silencing, heterochromatization and so on and so forth. So, I will not discuss bisulfide sequencing in detail at this stage, but if you are interested right now, you can actually go to this particular web website in Wikipedia where there is a very nice uh, write up or very nice description of how bisulfide sequencing is actually done. <coughs> now, what I would like to now discuss is that the DNA methylation. So, before DNA methylation, we discussed about histone acetylation, histone deacylation, histone methylation, histone demethylation, histone phosphorylation. Now, I talked about DNA methylation, but in vivo, I am going to tell you that all these are interrelated because I told you just now the mechanism by which DNA methylation inhibits transcription is actually by recruiting histone deacylases to the vicinity of the promoter. This is how DNA methylation actually regulates gene expression. So, all these mechanisms are actually intercalated. So, do not assume that just because we are discussing uh, as different uh, lecture series uh, histone acetylation separately, histone deacylation separately, DNA methylation separately, they all occur in a particular sequence. At any given promoter, all these mechanisms have to actually act together in order to either turn on or turn off the expression of a particular gene. Okay. So, let us just spend some time to see how these histone modifications and DNA methylation work in concert with each other to regulate the expression of a particular gene. Mm. Let us assume for example, let us take one particular example, what is the link between histone methylation and DNA methylation? Let us assume we have a promoter 
in which you have a histone uh, you have a histones here and we are now focusing our attention on histone and the lysine 9 residue of histones and let us say in this part the promoter region there is a, uh, a particular CPG island the cytosine is methylated here. Now, what happens if this, this methyl cytosine is now recognized by a uh, methyl by MBD domain containing protein that is a methyl CPG recognition protein and this methyl CPG printing protein can actually now recognize can actually recruit a histone methyl transferase and this histone methyl transferase can now recruit then HP1. And if you remember uh, uh, earlier uh, the histone methyl transfer actually uh, we discussed very intensely about HP1 and histone methyl, methyl transferase and so on and so forth. These HP1 is now actually recognized can uh, uh, recognize the uh, methyl lysine residues and they can bring about heterochromatization. So, you can see the binding of a methyl uh, uh, MBD containing protein uh, to a methylated promoter can result in the recruitment of histone methyl transferase which methylates an lysine residue of a histone H3 and that is now recognized by the methylated lysine recognizing protein like the HP1 which will then initiate heterochromatization leading to repression of transcription. So, there is a link between histone methylation and DNA methylation here transcription depression. There is another example for example here where instead of a <coughs> let us say for example a DNA methyl transferase actually methylates a cytosine residue here and then this DNA methyl transferase can now recruit a histone methyl transferase and then histone methyl transferase now methylates the uh, lysine residue and this lysine residue methylated lysine is now recognized by HP1 and therefore it will result resulting in negative regulation of gene expression. So, in one case the, the um, um, MBD contained protein interact with histone methyl transferase here the DNA methyl transferase is actually you know, is interacting with a histone methyl transferase both of them resulting in the repression of gene expression. Okay. And the examples I am giving you because if you now go into textbooks of going to literature there are number of examples for each one of these situations. There are some genes where a DNA methyl transferase recognizes a methyl CPG containing uh, DNA and recruits a histone methyl transferase or in other case an MBD contained protein uh, interacts with the histone methyl transferase and brings about re regulation or repression of gene expression. Here is another example again methylation of a uh, cytosine by DNA methyl transferase may result in the recruitment of a HDAC a histone deacetylase and this histone deacetylase now will remove the histone of a specific lysine residue in the H3 and as a result it can result in negative regulation of transcription. So, in the previous two examples I told you the interactions between a DNA methyl transferase and a histone methyl transferase or an MBD contained protein and a histone methyl transferase. Here we are showing a DNA methyl transferase can also interact with a, a, a multi protein complex containing a histone deacetylase and as a result DNA methylation can lead to histone deacetylation that can result in the repression of transcription. <coughs> Another example here a MBD containing protein can actually recognize a CPG uh, a methylated cytosine residue and this MBD protein can now interact with a histone deacetylase and this can again bring about deacetylation of specific lysine residues in H3 or H4 and therefore result in repression of transcription. So, I just gave you four examples just to give you an idea that DNA methylation actually serves as a kind of a signal for the recruitment of other uh, histone modifiers especially negative regulators of histone uh, transcription and either by histone methylation or by histone deacetylation transcription depression is brought about. So, DNA methylation actually works in conjunction with some of the histone modifying activities. Now, I just want to take some uh, maybe couple of minutes just to explain the DNA methylation has a very profound uh, effect not only just on uh, gene expression, but also a number of other physiological processes. <coughs> In fact, here is an example where I want to discuss with you that methylation of cytosine can also lead to mutations, create a mutation. For example, there is what is called as a spontaneous deamination. Now, there is a spontaneous deamination of cytosine and with spontaneous deamination of cytosine can actually convert cytosine into uracil. Whereas, if this cytosine by the action of this DNA methyl transferases is converted to methyl cytosine, and if methyl cytosine undergoes spontaneous deamination, you can see methyl cytosine deamination will result in the formation of thymine. Now, there are enzymes, for example, there are something like a uracin D glycosylase, there are many other enzymes so like this DNA repair pathway. We will not go into those details because our focus is primarily on gene regulation, but just suffice to know at this point that uh, 
Cytosine methylation by DNA methyltransferase can also lead to specific mutations, okay, wherein a cytosine normally on DNA methylation becomes uracil, whereas a methyl cytosine on DNA methylation gives rise to thymine. <coughs> now, DNA methylation has a very, very profound influence in cancer. <coughs> it turns out, I told you very clearly, when you have the CPG islands in the promoter region of a gene, and when these CPG islands are demethylated or it is present in a non-methylated form, then it is very, very likely that this promoter is active or this gene is actively transcribed. Whereas, the CPG residues in the promoter regions of this gene, if it is in methylated and it is very likely that that gene is not active, that gene is repressed. It turns out, in many of the cases, methylation of the CPGs in the promoter regions of tumor suppressor genes, if this gene turns out to be a tumor suppressor gene, as you know, cancer is the result of two groups of genes called as oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Now, oncogenes are those if they are, they are actually, it is like an automobile having a brake and an accelerator. So, you can regulate the speed of an automobile either by pressing a brake or pressing an accelerator. So, oncogenes is like an accelerator. So, they promote cell proliferation. Okay? So, if you over express oncogenes, the cells divide faster. Just like if you press an accelerator, the car drives much faster. If you express oncogenes very highly, the cells will develop. So, they promote cell proliferation. Whereas, the tumor suppressor genes act like brakes. So, they actually control, decrease the speed of an automobile or they decrease the speed of the, of the cell proliferation. So, you remember, so what happens if you now methylate the promoters of a tumor suppressor gene? So, the tumor suppressor genes will not be expressed. That means, the brakes will not function properly and therefore, cells start dividing uncontrollably. On the other hand, if you now demethylate the CPG residues of oncogenes, then the oncogenes will start expressing at very high levels. That means, you are pressing the accelerator very fast and therefore, uh, the automobile goes very fast. That means, cells will start dividing very fast and resulting in uncontrolled cell proliferation. And in many cases, it has been turned out in certain specific cancers when they found out in a particular in many tumor types, the tumor cell line either has methylation of CPG residues in tumor suppressor genes or demethylation of the promoters of the oncogenes. And in fact, this is where the uh, compounds like acetylcytin became very important anti-cancer agents because in cases where the tumor suppressor genes are actually methylated, if you now take such kind of cancer cells and treat them as azacytidine, what happens? Azacytidine will get now incorporated to the DNA and therefore, the azacytidine cannot be, azacytosine cannot be methylated and therefore, these tumor suppressor promoters will now be active and therefore, the tumor suppressor genes are expressed and therefore, you can press the brakes very fast and cell proliferation can be inhibited. So, by simply treating certain tumor cells with inhibitors of DNA methylation such as azacytidine, you can actually inhibit the proliferation of cancer cells. So, this is one important application that came out of the studies on DNA methylation, where certain inhibitors of DNA methylation can actually be used for anti-cancer therapy. <coughs> now, DNA methylation also has a very, very profound influence on a number of other processes. I have listed some of them here. For example, genomic imprinting, X chromosome inactivation, gene silencing, regulation of tissue specific expression, maintenance of heterochromatin. Now, we are going to discuss each one of these topics in detail in the few classes which come in the next series of lectures, but today we are going to focus only on the regulation of gene expression and DNA methylation, but just remember the, the DNA methylation has a very important role not only in regulation of gene expression, but also is a number of uh, cellular processes. <coughs> For example, the generation of gene, genomic DNA methylation pattern is a very dynamic process and it requires demethylation and de novo methylation by the action of two de, no, de novo methyl transferases. So, if you, if you take for example, any given time either from development to the adult, there is a nice homeostasis between methylation of DNA and demethylation. So, certain regions of the chromatin are kept in a methylated states and certain genes of the chromatin are kept in a demethylated state. So, this generation of this genomic methyl pattern is a very dynamic process and depends on the uh, interactions between methyl transferases and demethyl demethylases. And there are actually two DNA methyl transferases called DN DNMT3A and DNMT3B, which are actually uh, involved for this maintenance of this uh, methylated chromatin in vivo, <coughs> especially during gametogenesis and early embryonic development. Now, once a specific methylation pattern are created, they are perpetuated by maintenance methyl transferase called DNMT1 leading to their somatic inheritance. 
So, basically what I am trying to say is that there are a number of DNA methyl transferases, some of them actually involved in the maintenance of the DNA methyl transferase and some of them are involved in specific methylation of DNA at specific stages of development. And in fact, people have found out when you have mutations in specific DNA methyl transferases, it can actually lead to certain, it can result in the manifestation of certain genetic disorders clearly indicating that DNA methyl methylation is a very important phenomenon and mutations in enzymes which are catalyzing DNA methylation can result in certain genetic disorders. Here is one example where chromosomal instability and immunodeficiency syndrome caused by mutations in a DNA methyl transferase gene. In this paper, the authors have clearly shown that there is a recessive autosomal disorder called as ICF syndrome which stands for immunodeficiency, centromere instability and fascian anomalies. It is a kind of a genetic disorder and in these patients which, which the, the clinical manifestation is they contain varying, uh, they contain a drastic reduction in serum immunoglobin levels and they also succumb to infectious diseases before they reach adulthood. Okay. They are highly susceptible to number of infectious diseases and if they took these ICF patients and then looked at where the mutation is and they found that the mutations are actually in the gene that encodes for a DNA methyl transferase 3B. Clearly indicating that if you tamper with DNA methylation enzymes, it can manifest as genetic disorders, claiming that DNA methylation regulates the expression of very, very important genes that are required for normal functioning of or normal for homeostasis during uh, the lifespan of an adult. Mm. And very, very importantly, DNA methylation is globally erased during gametogenesis and embryogenesis and is then re-established. Re this I, I am mentioning here although it is not directly related to gene expression because today we are talking about what are called as stem cells, right. <coughs> now, people are talking about iPS cells, people are talking about taking a well differentiated skin cell or a well integrated fibroblast and converting them into an embryonic stem cell. Now, in all these cases what is happening is that many a times it has not been successful. All this, all this uh, differentiation, if you take a differentiated cell and want to convert them into a totipotent embryonic stem cell, although people are trying a variety of systems, somewhat has not been very highly successful mainly because the methylation pattern of DNA in a highly differentiated cell has to be completely erased if this differentiated cell has to become a stem cell. Because during normal development at the time of gametogenesis, the demethylation map, map is completely erased and then when the embryo during development, a DNA methylation pattern is totally re-established. So, in addition to the genetic code, this DNA methylation pattern also plays a very important role during development and differentiation. That is why this conversion of this in adult cell into stem cells, all these things have a lot of problems because the signature, the DNA methyl signature of an adult differentiated cell is very, very different from the DNA methylation signature of a embryonic stem cell. So, if you have to convert in adult uh, differentiated cell into an embryonic stem cell, you have to make sure that this DNA methyl signature which is there in the differential is completely erased or it has been completely modified to become that of a stem cell and then only it becomes successful. Mm. And there are what is called as a very, very important phenomenon which is actually called as genomic imprinting. Now, in the case of genomic imprinting, some genes are expressed only from the maternal genome whereas, certain genes are expressed only from a paternal genome. <coughs> okay. And it is estimated that about 40 genes are imprinted and they can be found on several different chromosomes. So, this is actually called a genomic imprinting. That means, we have both the maternal allele and paternal allele, but when they fuse and form a zygote, certain genes only the maternal allele is expressed, whereas in case of certain genes only the paternal allele is impressed. This has very profound uh, 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 implications, especially when you have an XX or XY phenotype, but we will not go into the details. But the point I want to tell you is that the DNA methylation actually plays a very, very important role in this kind of a genomic imprinting. Okay. So, DNA methylation is very, very important for uh, this kind of a maternal paternal inheritance of genes. So, the reason why I am emphasizing the role of DNA methylation in all these uh, uh, experiments is that so far we are we have all studied that there are only about four bases in DNA, namely adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine. But pe with people realizing the importance of cytosine or importance of methyl cytosine in a number of physiological processes, people have now realized that in fact, methyl cytosine actually now becomes a fifth base. Because of its physiological importance in a number of uh, cellular processes, methyl cytosine is actually is now recognized as a, sec a fifth important base for a number of physiological processes. 
So, in addition to adenine guanine cytosine and thymine, methyl cytosine has also now become very, very important component of DNA because of its various uh, 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 variable role in number of cellular processes. And because of this DNA methylation, a new term or a new terminology has been coined to understand gene expression changes that take place without actually change in the genetic sequence of an organism and that is what is known as the epigenetic regulation of gene expression. Okay. So, so far we discussed histone modifications has resulted in what is called as a histone code. In addition to we, we are all very familiar with the genetic code which is actually the determined by the sequence of bases in a DNA, DNA and which is inherited from generation after generation. But after discussing all the histone post translation modifications and then understanding how post translation modifications of histones play a very important role in the regulation of gene expression, we brought in what is called as a histone code in the last few classes. But now, after studying the role of DNA methylation and how DNA methylation regulates a number of physiological processes, DNA methylation in combined combination with histone modifications now constitute what is called say epigenetic code. You have genetic code, histone code, now we are talking about an epigenetic code. Now, what is an epigenetic code? The epigenetic code is a defining code in every eukaryotic cell consisting of specific epigenetic modification in the each, each cell. Like just I told you, the epigenetic modifications present in for example, liver cell may be different from the epigenetic modification in a brain cell, although the genetic code is the same. Okay. Similarly, the epigenetic footprint of a, a zygote <coughs> is very different from the epigenetic modification, let us say after maybe 50 or 60 uh, 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 division, cell divisions. It is all because there is an active programming involving DNA methylation or histone modifications and this epigenetic map changes in different cell types and also in different stages during development. So, th this study of inheritance of certain traits which is not exactly is dependent on the DNA sequence is known as epigenetics. <coughs> So, this epigenetic modifications actually consist of histone modifications as defined by the histone code and an additional epigenetic modifications involving DNA methylation. So, DNA methylation in conjunction with histone modifications such as histone acetylation, deacetylation, phosphorylation and so on and so forth can actually bring out what is called as a epigenetic regulation of gene expression and these epigenetic maps differ in different cell types and also during different stages of development. So, the basis for epigenetic code is a system above the genetic code of a single cell. This is very, very important for it. Remember, that is why I am emphasizing very importantly, in addition to genetic code, you have several new codes that are coming up. One is called a histone code based on the post transfer modifications of histones, although we are many people argue that the histone code is not really perfect. Remember, genetic code by actually looking at the exact sequence of DNA, you can exactly predict what kind of a protein will be made the genetic you can actually predict what kind of a protein will be made, what kind of phenotype you will get depending upon the genetic code. But the histone code we still have not understood this histone code epigenetic code so well, so perfectly that we cannot really predict a specific phenotype depending upon a specific histone code or specific epigenetic code. So, we still have a long way to go understand. Uh, so, many people think that it is too early or too premature to actually use these terms like histone code and epigenetic code because you cannot really predict what the phenotype is going to be depending upon a specific code. So, while in one individual genetic code in each cell is the same, the epigenetic code is tissue and cell specific. So, this is a very, very important point I am emphasizing. In fact, this is, a, this is the outcome of all the 10 lectures we have done so far. Based on all these 10 lectures, we, we initially started with the describing how transcription regulation takes place in the naked DNA. Remember, if you had been studying gene regulation only on naked DNA, this new concept of histone code and epigenetic code would not have come at all. But the moment people realized that gene regulation actually happens on chromatin templates and the chromatin structure is intricately linked to the regulation of gene expression and one has to modify histones and one has to modify DNA by modifying cytosine residues, you can actually regulate gene expression and these very profound observations have actually now brought on a new concept of what is called as epigenetics or epigenetic regulation of gene expression and is now very, very becoming clear that the methylation pattern the cytosine methylation patterns or histone modification patterns may vary from different cells in an adult organism and also varies very profoundly during embryonic development. And therefore, although all the cells of our body has the same genetic code, the histone code and the epigenetic code of these different cell types may vary from cell to cell and also from uh, um, different stages of development. 
So, the term epigenetics is often used to study heritable traits that do not involve changes in the underlying DNA sequence. Very, very important for you to know this. <coughs> so, what I have told you so far <coughs> is let us just take a very brief review of all the uh, topics we have studied so far. <coughs> the important concept that I would like to convey up to this stage of our lecture series, because this, this marks a very important uh, uh, part of this entire lecture series. We have discussed very briefly how transcription takes place on a DNA template in the absence of chromatin, in the absence of histones. That is how we started with. And we discussed that there is an RNA polymerase enzyme. And this RNA polymerase enzyme in order to go and bind to the core promoter region requires the help of general transcription factors. Then these general transcription factors include TF2A, TF2B, D, E and F. And it is with the help of these general transcription factor that the RNA polymerase 2 is brought into the core promoter region and that is how transcription initiation takes place. Then we discussed very importantly that the core promoter region, many of you might have studied the core promoter actually means only Tata box, but we discussed it is not just the Tata box, there are many variations of the core promoter elements like the initiator, BRE and so on and so forth. And these variations of the core promoter elements can itself bring about differential gene regulation. Then we discussed, although people talk about in textbooks about only general transcription factor means TF2A, B, D, E and F. There are variations within the general transcription factors. There, for example, there are many TAFs, the TBP associated factors, which are expressed in a cell type specific manners, and they actually bring about differential gene regulation. So, variations within the general transcription factor itself can bring about differential gene regulation. Then we discussed that it is not just the co promoter region, there are other upstream sequences which play a very, very important role in the regulation of gene expression and variations in this upstream uh, uh, elements which actually serve as binding sites for various transcription factors that actually contribute to different levels of activation or repression of gene expression. And then we discussed how specific eukaryotic transcription activators or transcription repressors which magically contain two major domains called as the DNA binding domains and transcription activation domains. And through these DNA binding domains, they interact with specific cis acting elements and through the transactivation domains interact with the components of the pre initiation complex and then facilitate faster recruitment or slower recruitment of RNA polymerase leading to either activation or repression of transcription, variations of the rate of transcription initiation. And we also discussed what are the major kind of DNA binding domains that are present in eukaryotic transcription factors. For example, we have what called as leucine zipper, sorry, helix turn helix motifs, you have helix loop helix motifs, you have zinc finger motifs, you have leucine zipper motifs and through some of these major DNA binding domain motifs, these transcription factors bind to specific sequence of DNA. We also discussed a number of experimental techniques like gel mobility shift assays, DNA S1 footprinting, etcetera, which are normally used for identifying transcription factor binding sites in various promoter, promoter elements. And we also then discussed what are the functional assays which are actually used for studying eukaryotic gene regulation. We discussed about cell transfection assays, wherein you can take promoters linked to reporter genes and you can make different deletions of the promoter regions and then by assaying the reporter gene activity, you can actually measure the rate of uh, uh, the strength of a promoter by transferring them into cell lines. And then we, we discussed in very detail about what is called the cell free transcription studies, wherein you can prepare nuclear extracts which are transcriptionally competent. A lot of effort has actually gone to discover for development of the cell free transcription assays. And using these kinds of nuclear extracts, people have actually put naked DNA templates into these nuclear extracts and then started uh, uh, identifying transcription factors and promoter regions which are essential for transcription initiation. Then we came into a very important facet of gene regulation where we discussed DNA is not actually naked. DNA is actually started with histones in the form of nucleosomes and therefore, studying transcription regulation on naked DNA templates is of no use. We actually have to study gene regulation in the context of chromatin templates and that is why we brought in the concept of histone modifications and we discussed very briefly how there are a number of enzymes which either add an acetyl group, these are called as HATs or histone acetyl transferases. There are enzymes called HDACs histone deacetylases, which remove histones from uh, chromatin templates leading to negative regulation of gene expression. And there are, and there is a very fine equilibrium between HATs and HDACs and this dynamic equilibrium between the two actually result, uh, describes whether the gene has to be activated or a gene has to be repressed. 
Then we talked about histone methylation and histone demethylases. Histone methylation generally results in repression of transcription, whereas demethylation results in the activation of transcription. Then we brought in the concept of histone phosphorylation. And with all the studies of this histones and their role in gene regulation, we brought in what is called as a histone code. And we discussed how important is the histone code for the regulation of gene regulation. Then now recently, we have brought in the concept of DNA methylation in this class, wherein we have discussed how there are enzymes called as DNA methyl transferases, which are involved in methylation of specific DNA sequences, uh, especially the CPG motifs in the promoter DNA. And when these CPG islands or the CPG motifs are methylated by DNA methyl transferases, these methylated cytosines are recognized by specific enzymes which contain called as the methyl binding domains. And through these methyl binding domains, these proteins recognize these methyl cytosines they then go ahead and recruit a specific histone deacetylases or histone methyl transferases. So, DNA methylation in conjunction with histone modifying enzymes can actually lead to repression of transcription. And a most important thing that we have learnt in this class is that DNA methylation has a very profound role in a number of cellular processes in addition to regulation of gene expression. And that is why the methyl cytosine is actually now recognized as the fifth base in addition to adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine. Okay. And in fact, a number of uh, research is now going on at a very fast pace to identify small molecules which can actually inhibit DNA methylation. And in many cases, people have actually shown many specific cancer types can be the proliferation of this cancer cell can be inhibited by treating these tumors with specific inhibitors of DNA methylation. So, the understanding the mechanism of DNA methylation has had a very profound effect on cancer research. A number of these compounds which are actually DNA methylation inhibitors are being tested in human clinical trials to see whether they can be developed as therapeutic agents for anti-cancer therapy. <laughs> okay. And uh, in the last part, we have actually discussed and introduced a new concept or a new comp uh, component called as an epigenetic code. And DNA methylation in conjunction with the histone modifications or histone post transfer modifications together constitute what is called as an epigenetic code. And an important take home message that I have given uh, from these lectures is that the genetic code of an organism is probably the same in almost all the cells of a body. You take a liver cell or a brain cell or a muscle cell or during development, nothing happens, the gene, gene sequence is the same. But the differential gene expression that we see is actually because of epigenetic modifications that are taking place. The reason why certain genes are expressed in liver cell are not being expressed in a muscle cell, but a different set of genes are getting expressed during development and uh, during various tissue types is mainly because these kind of epigenetic changes that are, are taking place in these different cell types are different and therefore, understanding these epigenetic modifications have a very, very profound influence in understanding gene regulation. In fact, people have actually started now identifying how even nutrition affects these kind of a epigenetic regulation of gene expression. For example, DNA methylation. <coughs> now, the important there are there are the, there are many of our footsteps actually. Uh, if you now take certain methyl donors, if methyl donors are present in many of our footsteps that we take in, then it actually promotes histone methylation or DNA methylation, and therefore the gene expression changes actually changes. So, if you take certain mice and then feed them with a diet which are actually methane methyl donors, for example, certain kind of a folate derivatives. So, remember many of this methylation reaction involves tetrahydrofolate, whereas the methyl tetrahydrofolate and tetrahydrofluorate plays a very, very important role in many of these methylation reactions. So, if you now treat animals or if you take animals and feed them with a food which is very, very rich in these methyl donors and compare them with these mice with those which are not for these methyl donors, there are profound changes in the gene regulation. So, people are advocating the kind of diet that you are taking, smoking, when you actually smoke, you are actually taking up many methyl donors and these methyl donors now when you take in, they actually promote methylation of histones or methylation of DNA and therefore, it can have a profound effect on gene expression. So, how environmental factors are affecting our gene regulation or affecting our gene expression is primarily determined by epigenetic regulation of gene expression. So, I think I will conclude here primarily to tell you that DNA methylation has emerged as a very, very important uh, mechanism by which regulation of gene expression takes place in eukaryotes. And methyl cytosine has emerged as a very, very important uh, uh, base in addition to the uh, four uh, bases that, uh, that are very well recognized. And 
this uh, studies on DNA methylation in combination with histone modifications has signaled a new era of research and this is what is known as the epigenetic regulation of gene expression. And this epigenetic has now become very important not only to understand regulation of gene expression, but also to chromatin structure. <coughs> and in fact, we have, we have discussed now that if you look at for example, heterochromatin where the chromatin is very tightly bound to DNA, where the histones are very tightly bound to DNA and you look at the euchromatin and you know a specific methyl uh, specific acetylation of uh, the specific methylation of histones uh, or specific deacetylated histones there are signatures which are very very characteristic of euchromatin and there are very very characteristic signatures of histones which are characteristic of heterochromatin and the same way with the chromatin regions which are not very highly expressed actually contain methyl cytosines or uh, uh, DNA methylated, uh, DNA is highly methylated and DNA methylation in conjunction with histone uh, modification seems to be playing a very, very important role in determining whether a chromatin in that particular region is going to be transcriptionally active or the chromatin in that region is going to be transcriptionally active and there is a very dynamic equilibrium between enzymes which modify histones as well as enzymes which modify DNA. And all these things in concert bring about what is called as an epigenetic regulation of gene expression. So, I think with this lecture series, I have actually concluded one part of regulation of gene expression, wherein we brought in the concept of histones and the concept of DNA methylation and how all these factors together are contributing to the regulation of gene expression in carriers. What we will do in the next class is to bring about another important component of gene regulation, namely how chromatin structure is modified or chromatin structure can also be modified by what is called as a chromatin remodeling enzymes, ATP dependent chromatin remodeling and its effects on gene regulation. So, what I am going to tell you in the next class is that in addition to modification of histone tails, you can also there are also enzymes which can move nucleosomes or which can move histones on the nucleosomes by a ATP driven process and this ATP dependent remodeling of chromatin also plays a very, very important role in the regulation of gene expression. So, chromatin remodeling and this effects on gene regulation will be discussed in the next class. <coughs> Thanks.